Nem voi aloittaa. Hello, good morning everybody. Good morning. And welcome to the second day of European Conference on Mental Health. Uh, it's good to see you all here this morning and greetings from Finland. Uh, the cloud, the sky is a little bit gray, but otherwise beautiful morning here. So we hope that you became familiar with the Hopin platform yesterday and uh, we noticed that there were many people on speed dates, for example, in the evening. I hope you had fun and today we have organized another appointment for speed dates in the end of the day where you can reflect the conference or discuss what you want. Yeah, that was fun. I was mm. I had uh, five dates yesterday and that was really fun. I, <laughs> I enjoy it and I will be there. Too. You will? Yeah. Okay. It Sounds was good. fun. Yeah. We also have, before the speed dates, we have an open discussion and reflection about the conference, and that will happen in a, in a room called Open yes. Discussion and yeah. Reflection. Yeah, because uh, there was a small mistake in the program somewhere that uh, this reflection session is in ECMH Cafe, but it's not. It's There's a room in the sessions, and the room is called Open. But now, when you mention the ECMH cafe, that is open all the time. So yeah. when you want to mingle around, go to cafe, and probably you find someone to talk to there also. Yeah. But otherwise, we will follow, of course, the program. <laughs> uh, you can see the sessions for today in the session section, and just click the number of the session you want to participate, and you will find your your program there. For presenters, we would like to remind that go to your session room uh, 10, five minutes before the session and there will be people helping you and, and, and ready to uh, chair the sessions. Uh, remember our social media channels, be active in social media and use our hashtag uh, and remember the, the to take breaks and uh, and maybe you have possibility to do some yoga exercises. You will find uh, this uh, yoga video in expo area. And remember also the posters. And that all can be found in expo. Okay, but shall we continue now with uh, Mr. Liam McGavin from Ireland? It's your stage is yours, Liam. Welcome. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks, Larry. Good uh, morning or good mid-afternoon, folks. Um, it's a little bit strange sitting here looking at my presentation, knowing that you're an outdoor summer, but I can't see you. Um, I'm delighted to be here today. It would have been great to be in Lisbon, but it's nonetheless great to be part of this conference um, again, um, I, as I have, I think, every year, like minus one year so so thanks thanks very much for inviting me uh in vipro my session today um is rather than a kind of a research findings or rather than trying to say the way things should be or have some sort of great idea that i'd like to share with you is really one around uh it's a critical i suppose it's a critical review of this thing called collaboration in mental health practice that um, throughout the world we've been playing with for, for, for quite some time now. Um, and I use the word play, uh, not playfully. Uh, I use it because sometimes we've created words in mental health that on paper suggest we do something that in reality we don't necessarily do. So what I'm going to try and do today is to unpack uh, some of the nature of collaboration and maybe the why um, and maybe why not. Um, I'm not making any assumption in this paper that uh, people should collaborate necessarily. But one of the things I'd like to say at the end of the paper is that if we are genuinely in a collaborative place in mental health uh, practice, then there are certain concepts, there are certain um, truths we have to hold on to in order to be able to genuinely collaborate. 
Uh, I'm going to go, go straight through these. And as far as I know, there's going to be some kind of questions or commentary at the end of it. I'm normally used to slightly more interaction, but we'll, we'll get that at the end, I hope. <clears throat> so just to be clear, my story here today is just one narrative, just one critical social uh, theoretical perspective um, uh, over a period of, um, I suppose, 25, 30 years of myself working as a mental health practitioner, um, as an academic and educationalist and as a researcher. The collaboration I'm talking about specifically today is collaboration with people who use mental health services or who struggle with life and may not even wish to use services, but want to uh, want help with their life, want help with their mental health. Once we move into a context, a collaboration, a more than one, a more than an I to a we, my position becomes really important in that. I don't mean mine personally, I mean the, the I position. Um, and also the history in the story or the history in the context. So very briefly, I'll, I'll, I'll just outline as I come into this kind of story and collaboration, my position. So I'm a, I'm a mental health practitioner, a uh, mental health nurse, alternative. Um, uh, amongst a few other bits and pieces. Um, I still work on an acute psychiatric admission unit uh, one day a week. I'm employed by Dublin City University. I'm a researcher. In particular, I'm an action researcher. Uh, participatory inquiry um, would drive most of uh, my research projects and, and almost the entire program of research I'm involved in, which incidentally is about transforming dialogues in mental health communities. I am an educationalist. Uh, I work as an academic um, as well. Uh, I am a researcher and uh, I'm a community activist. Uh, and I live in the mountains in Wicklow outside Dublin and Ireland. In terms of, I suppose, uh, my history in relation to this story, uh, very soon after I realized uh, I was the best mental health nurse in the world, I started to see the cracks in that. Um, and this is way back in the uh, early 90s. Um, and most of those cracks in that kind of delusion that I was carrying were brought about by reflections coming from service users, coming from patients, coming from people with experience of mental health problems. Um, reflections that it took a while for me to listen to because uh, we weren't necessarily trained to listen to everything that the patient says, just in case it was delusionary or hallucinatory or made up or whatever. Um, so from there on in, I began to question um, this notion of expert, expert nurse, expert doctor, expert psychologist, expert social worker, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, my story in terms of involvement and collaboration uh, began. And it kind of started with when I returned um, to Ireland from working in England for a long time with uh, the, the notion that in the educational establishment that employed me, there was no service user involvement in education. Um, there was no service user involvement in, in development of services. Um, there was no service user involved at that time, even in policy development. So I suppose very quickly I started off collaborating with service users, with people who use services, with family members of people who use services, um, and began a kind of a long story of collaborative projects, be it changing services, be it uh, action research, or be it developing programs in uh, academic institutions that were collaborative, co-produced and co-delivered. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I'm, I'm not going to go too far into that because when I try to give some examples of where collaboration might work despite its challenges, I'll give a couple of those examples in at least my history of being developed uh, involved in this story. Some of you may have heard full presentations on some of these pieces in the history, so I'm only I'm not going to say too much about them. I'm just going to use them as examples of collaboration uh, with the successes and challenges. So my intention for today is to, I suppose, question whether collaboration is relevant, necessary, or possible. Um, contextualize collaboration within societal views on where mental health practice fits. Um, talk a little bit about the rise of the expert by experience and service user involvement. 
um, and experiential knowledge as some sort of knowledge that's kind of on parity or on par with academic knowledge and to look at where that fits in the whole kind of hierarchy of power, hierarchy of knowledge and ways of knowing in mental health practice. Um, some of the drivers for collaboration, why, why collaborate? Um, you know, who decided it was a good idea and who's pushing for this collaboration? Some examples, as I said, and maybe imagining a paradigm where collaboration is the way. Um, and hopefully in the next kind of 30 minutes or so, um, I'll come to uh, um, a happy ending in the story, but let's see what happens. So first of all, the assumption that collaboration is necessary or even relevant um, is just that, is an assumption, uh, is a discourse, is something that people have started to talk about. Because to some extent, mental health practice isn't set up to require collaboration. In fact, collaboration is kind of, um, kind of defies some of the reasons for having mental health practice in the first place. Let's just take the societal level. We have and have had for a long time the ability for people to check out of life, the ability for people not to have to work, the ability for people to be able to sit down and um, go back into themselves and not take um, a completely fulfilling position in family and community and society. That's a societal given role, the sick role. Um, but with the sick role comes the passive recipient, which is the patient, and then the active uh, participa participation of the professional who will maintain the sick role after such a time as that person is ready to take a, a meaningful role back in society again. Over the years, and this is not just an old age thing, this is still a modern thing, the requirement to segregate people, people with mental health problems, people that are different, people that are other, to what's perceived as the norm um, is still, it's still there within society. It's there in the media, it's there in the government, uh, it's there ingrained into every member of society. We have systemic stigma and discrimination uh, across the board in relation to people with mental health problems from family, from community and employment and education. Um, and indeed, uh, from people working in the mental health services. So that, that's a role and that's something that happens. It's not something that's done to be cruel. It's not something that's done, um, you know, as some sort of uh, maybe Star of David approach. Um, although there are many who would argue it is a Star of David approach. Social control is really, really important in a forever, a forever developing risk society um, uh, across the globe. Social control becomes even more and more relevant and more and more important. We're seeing that no less now, particularly with uh, government restrictions uh, and this time of COVID. Um, it's a reminder to us how social control for some is deemed necessary and how social control can be applied. For example, by stigmatizing those who don't test or stigmatizing those who don't wear masks or stigmatizing those who go to the psychiatric clinic. Um, we are still in a position, uh, at least in the West uh, and the North of the globe, where the doctor knows best. We have the three wise men approach uh, within kind of Western society. We have medicine. We have, uh, we used to have religion, now I think capitalism, and we have the law. So the doctor is one of those three wise pillars that keeps society safe and keeps society um, healthy. The doctor knows best. So no real need for collaboration there. The doctor has been trained. And of course, the acolytes of the doctor and the tentacles of the doctor. So society doesn't necessarily feel collaboration is necessary. In service design, development and provision, well, we, we have it in policy now. It's almost like we tick a box and we have consultation with service users when we develop policy. And we have expert service users or experts uh, with uh, experience of mental health problems. Um, and, and we don't need too many of them. It doesn't necessarily need collaboration. We just need to maybe cooperate. We just need to have one or two there with us. We have evidence-based medicine. It works. Why actually change something that works? Obviously, there's those who turn around to each other and say, of course, evidence-based medicine doesn't work. Um, it has its place. You know, so, for example, only 25% of nurses use evidence-based medicine. It doesn't mean that they're crap nurses. It means that evidence-based medicine has a place, 
but only a place in the overall kind of role of, of, of practice that we're involved in. We have expert managers and clinicians. Why don't we have to muddy the water and dirty the water? We're getting messed up by trying to collaborate with people who are struggling to actually uh, work in this world anyway. In education uh, of practitioners, um, you know, we have, you know, experts who spent years and years and years getting their PhDs and they're given discipline, they're well able to teach what people need to know to practice. That has been a long lasting and to this day, even though we have quite a lot of service user and alternative uh, educationalists to this day, there is still in academia this notion that you know, the academics who have developed in the discipline are probably the best people to teach. In research, well, it's going to get a bit messy if we start researching with our subjects. How are we going to be able to really understand what goes on in the heads of those people with mental health problems if we're equal with them, if we're working subject to subject, if we are researching together? That's not good empirical research. That's messy participatory research. Oh, my gosh. No, it would be difficult to do that. What happens if they started raising the research questions? Imagine if they asked the question, why should I take my meds? Jesus, the whole place would go mad. Um, imagine if they were the ones who were involved in creating the evidence in the first place. Sure, we'd have to throw out CBT, we'd have to throw out pharmaceutical, we'd probably get all sorts of very, very kind of hope dishes and kind of recovery trees and stuff like that. Um, what would we do as practitioners if we were to let them uh, take over the research agenda? Mm. However, it's already happening. So, for example, with the whole public and patient involvement agenda across at least the Western and Northern globe, it's now becoming necessary to collaborate with people with experience when we're undertaking research and social uh, care research, health and social care research. Um, in practice, imagine if we had to give up the no choice option. Imagine if there was no coercion. Imagine if we had to work subject to subject, like I was the same as my client and he or she was the same as me. Where would my ability to be able to kind of influence go if I can't advise and be the teacher and be the advisor and uh, many times have to manage somebody who's unable to manage themselves? Um, and of course, in the best interest of the client, an awful lot of the clients we meet, you know, obviously they're not working in their own interest. Um, so if we can't operate in the best interest of them and they can actually go around taking therapeutic risks, etc., what might that do for society and for practice? and for mental health and well-being. So it's a difficult choice. It's not necessarily necessary. Things have been okay from one perspective, from the professional perspective, from societal perspective. So we don't always have to, but if we do, here are some of the choices we have to make. Just quickly looking at collaborative. Well, wow, time's flying already. I think I started about four minutes late, so I'm gonna take those four minutes if that's okay. Uh, um, <clears throat> so it's a, it's, it's a relationship and that's key because often collaboration is seen as some sort of way of consulting. It's seen as a tick box. It's seen as having the person in the room, the token person in the room, but it's actually the development of a relationship where people choose to, co to cooperate and uh, to develop and accomplish shared outcomes. It's dynamic in terms of it moves. We don't know the end game. We don't know what the outcomes might be, but they will be more innovative than if it wasn't collaborative. Um, we won't quite be sure how the actual decision gets made in the end because of the nature of, some of people involved in the collaboration. We won't be quite sure who made a decision. It's a collaborative decision that's been made. Um, uh, much more so in contrast to coordinate, well, particularly cooperation um, that sometimes is used Sometimes collaboration is used where it should really be cooperation people are talking about in terms of the static relationship that are looking for a predetermined decision, product or solution, but with service user and family involvement, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Collaboration requires participation. I'm not, I'm not going to read too much into the, into the slides there, but you'll see there on the right-hand side, Einstein's ladder of, of, of participation, which is still used, even though it's been around for a long time, uh, in trying to indicate you know, where the kind of involvement or the level of participation is happening uh, for, for other. Um, uh, and if you think about it, uh, true participation, uh, we need to include power sharing. We need sustained deliberation for all those involved in the approach. It needs to create a communicative space um, so that it's truly systemic, so it's truly more than just one or two people making decisions and just having a group around them to actually come up with the same, same answers. So if we think about the challenge of participatory, take participatory action, 
for example. And just have a look at creating this reflective community space where collaboration is possible to happen comes with a lot of notions we have to deal with. We need to be able to reflect on our own values and our own principles. Maybe have to hand over to others that their ideas are better than ours. We need to be in a dialogical space where truths can be developed between the different perspectives in that collaboration. We need to think together as opposed to think about each other. Um, the status quo will have to be questioned. There will be resistance we'll have to overcome. And if we're collaboration and looking at something new or something innovative, the existing culture that's been ingrained will have to change and will change. And a counterculture born out of the collaboration will have to um, will have to evolve. Um, knowledge will be questioned. So my expert nursing knowledge may be completely overturned in favor of the experiential knowledge by the expert by experience. I have to be able to give up my power in order to have power sharing. I have to be able to become uncertain in my knowledge being the right kind of knowledge. And I have to be willing to build a relationship built on flattened power structures in order to truly collaborate. So there's a lot in it. Uh, oh, I've gone backwards, sorry. Let me just, okay. Um, one of the things I'd just like to touch on now is the rise of the survivor and service user movement. So this perhaps was the beginning of when people realized we're gonna to have to now start collaboration. It was, I suppose, born out of the civil rights movements where survivors of psychiatry, where people who just couldn't cope with psychiatry, wasn't work for, for them, they found it too oppressive, began to stand up and take charge of their own destinies. Um, the same is quite a lot about the civil rights movements. And this began to question the very fabric of psychiatry and the anti-psychiatry movement, for example, was born. This wasn't particularly um, a movement uh, that came out of survivors and service users. The anti-psychiatry also included psychiatrists themselves. I know other radical professionals, but it was part of the anti-psychiatry movement. And eventually, kind of over the years, you've, you've got this kind of going on for about 40 years or so now, that moved from a civil rights-based, although we still have civil rights-based uh, uh, survivor research or survivor activists, and I'll talk about that briefly in, in, in a couple of minutes. We have the service user movement began to evolve across Europe, across the world, and there's probably not a country now in Europe um, and the kind of Western uh, Northern globe where there's not a service user, survivor movement or organization organization that seeks to represent survivors and service users uh, within kind of policy development, within services development, et cetera, et cetera. We even moved into a space where we have service-led uh, services, such as crisis houses, such as peer support. Um, we have survivor research led by, developed by, and carried out by, and conducted by survivors. Um, and, and, and support uh, areas for, for, for people, uh, by people. Oh, we have the expert by experience now who, to some extent, would be argued as coming to their own as representative of the opposite to academic, the opposite to professional, uh, where the expertise born out of experience is on par with, say, academic and professional expertise. And then we kind of move on a little bit to the standardized involvement in policies and funded PPI research, etc. Um, we have professionalized service users, which are quite common, and, and some people refer to them as kind of all the same old faces, and I'm not sure whether that's good or bad. Um, and then, of course, we have the situation where a lot of service users have been tarnished by the services that they have been working with. And there's an argument that there's quite a lot of co-optation of service users when they're assimilated into um, the system itself. Okay, I'm going to just move a little bit faster here for a second. But just to, just to uh, I suppose, reflect here for a second that in relation to service users, there is as much power play, there's as much professionalization agendas within the service user movement itself as there is within the different kind of uh, mental health disciplines um, in terms of the hierarchy, authority, power, and, and who gets to have the most say. So it's, 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 it's quite a kind of a, a parallel, really. One of the things that is clear, though, that we've learned over the years, and obviously Einstein knew this quite a long time ago, is that if we continue to try and look at solutions with the same way of thinking that caused the problems in the first place, then we just perpetuate those problems. So without collaboration, without changing, without actually revisiting, reflecting on what we do, we're probably just going to, um, and have done for many, many years, perpetuate the problems 
that um, we caused in the first place. So collaboration gives us one option to move away from that. What is experiential knowledge? The thing that drives the need for collaboration with a different form of knowledge, a different way of knowing, a different way of being. It's a narrative experience of people who use mental health services or who experience mental health problems. Borkman, uh, who, who would have been kind of one of the classical kind of seminal, um, uh, I suppose, authors in relation to experiential knowledge, sees as a primary source of truth learned from personal experience and apply this to the mental health arena, that's where we get what we now call experts by experience. It's interesting, in the early 90s, Lindsay Pryor was, uh, I suppose, analyzing the rise of the lay person in healthcare, and is arguing that it's really, really important to have lay expertise, um, <clears throat> so that professional expertise uh, isn't just allowed to run roughshod over people's lives, over the notion that people have a quality of life besides their, their illness or their condition. Um, and a decade later, Pryor's analysis kind of switched to uh, a place where, okay, we've got lay expertise now, but it seems it's gone out of hand. Uh, it seems like the lay expert is almost more expert than the actual professional expert who spent years trying to train in the first place. Maybe we have to stop and slow the train down was the analysis of that stage. Um, <clears throat> Very, very valuable in consultation for policy development. However, however, often kind of some of the standard is that you'll have maybe one service user, one family member amongst 20 professionals, academics, etc., uh, as part of a consultation process. So whether we call that tokenism or professionalized service user, I I'm not sure. It's not for me to judge. It's required now in research funding to have service user involvement uh, and also in program service development in many countries. Um, and the opportunity there is for it to be tokenistic or for it to be collaborative. <clears throat> um, experiential knowledge uh, often seeks parity with professional evidence-based research knowledge. And a lot of people like Alison Faulkner, for example, would uh, often make the comparison between what we consider evidence-based practice as practitioners versus the evidence that people with experience would consider evidence. And often the twain shall never meet. Um, but if we have the two and the combined, then we have the opportunity to create some sort of middle road and some sort of beneficial, better place than if we follow the evidence-based medicine or the effective medicine for the individuals receiving the medicine in the first place. However, collaboration in relation to Einstein's ladder still tends to remain on the lower rungs of that ladder. Okay, 27. Collaboration has to embrace experiential and professional knowledge in equilibrium. That means as a professional, I have to give up power. I have to share my expertise, not perceive it as the best expertise. And I have to move into an arena of uncertainty. Um, only when I move from relationship based on object to subject, which is the present relationship between practice and patient in a lot of cases. Although I see probably 34 of you suddenly so saying, that's not true, Liam. In the dyad, into one-to-one, -one, it's purely collaborative, purely subject to subject. Um, yes, maybe, won't argue against that, won't argue with your practice, but we've got so many overarching organizationing kind of impositions that often prevents that subject to subject dia between client and, and practitioner from being actually subject to subject, person to person. There is still defining uh, frameworks in the back of our head, defining organizational structures that are influenced how we're engaging in that relationship with a person. But it needs to be subject to subject for real collaboration to be possible. And if we do have subject to subject, uh, and if that becomes part of how we do things, then we never quite view the people we're working with uh, the way we used to view them before or interact the way we used to interact before because we've moved from an objectification kind of, maybe let's call it parent to child, maybe not the right analogy, uh, position to an actual equity in terms of the power structure between the people. As with Pryor's contention, maybe collaboration is a step too far. So many barriers to overcome, stigma, culture, power dynamics, fear. This is all our fear as professionals, the professionalization agenda. Jesus, it's bad enough I have to fight to actually find my place among social workers, occupational therapists. Now I have to actually try to find my place amongst the experts by experience. I thought it was difficult in the first place. The language, the language of, say, psychiatry over my life. 
evidence, what constitutes evidence for me might not constitute evidence for a service user or a person with experience. Constructs of mental illness. I might call it mental illness. Somebody else might call it post-traumatic stress disorder. Somebody else might call it emotional distress. The constructs are often quite so diff difficult, uh, to, to different between the two, and how do we overcome that and engage with that? Why would you do it? It's so difficult. Problem is, the evidence says that collaborative ways of practicing have much better outcomes uh, than non-collaborative ways of practice. Of course, back into the language again, we have participation, we have the non-person with experienced champions. One of the interesting things in education and also in service development is um, you might have the tokenistic involvement, but often where you see uh, quite a lot of, um, of involvement, quite a lot of collaboration, that's carried through by a champion by a champion who's not a person with experience, but who believes in it. So in one way, that's great that as a champion can do it, but another way there's a question over what if that champion wasn't there? Would people bother to collaborate and involve other people? And that's a, that's an ongoing question. And there's a lot of research going into that at the moment. In fact, one of our friends, Brenda Happel is looking at, looking, I think at that at the moment as part of one of her research pieces. Um, often collaboration is too difficult. So as much as we've gone alone for so long as professionals, the service users, the people with experience, they're going alone as well. And so we don't want to collaborate, we'll do our own thing. The old adage, nothing about us without us, has kind of become a little bit of a cliche now, and it's almost kind of imprinted on every policy document, every service development, every organization says it, but to what extent is it integrated into a collaborative experience? Uh, and also have these, I suppose titles a bit like recovery being co-opted. So I'm just taking the co-production as one example. I'm not going to explain what it is. We've all know it as nauseam at this stage. But there's a little bit of a critique of um, co-production. This is more about co-option to make it look good. Service users are invited to sit in, but the agency has always decided where the car is going. So I need a service user to co-produce some education, uh, but I've got the learning outcomes already. I have a fair idea how the thing wants to go. I call in the service user and say, hey, service user, we need to deliver this. Are you able to deliver it uh, with me? Yeah, yeah. Well, if I do my piece in this, you do that, your piece in that. Yeah. That's, how does that sound? Good, good. Oh, great, great. Yeah, we'll do that. Co-production? Mm, don't know co-option maybe um, and I like this definition down here in the far right hand side <clears throat> you can read it yourself there for a second while I check the time uh, okay main drivers for collaboration however is a survivor service user movement they want it they want collaboration some of them want nothing to do with us and some of them want collaboration the evidence supports it CRPD, the Convention of the Rights of People with Disability, is a major driver for change. And in order for that change to happen, collaboration is absolutely necessary. It has been standardized into policy development. So whether we're cynical about that or not, the fact of the matter is it is in policy development and it is in most policy uh, that collaborative uh, ventures with service users with family members are the main. Since 2017, it's been interesting what's coming out from the United Nations. There's been a very, very strong overturning of the old medical notion of mental health practice and you can just see in this example here from special rapporteur in 2017 which was also perpetuated in 2020 his last report which is really looking for a much more collaborative for a complete shift in the paradigm of the medical psychiatric approach to care um, where collaboration is the norm and interesting when you do change the way you look at things the things you look at change I suppose one of the things that comes to mind briefly for me is if I look at somebody with mental health problems and I look through the lens of psychiatric diagnosis, I see several things. I see delusions, I see hallucinations, I see disorder, I see disability. If I look at the same person through a trauma lens, then I see somebody who's had a traumatized life. I see somebody who's having kind of um, symptoms of ongoing uh, trauma, of continuing to live a life through the actual trauma lens to undischarged neural pathways that need um, renegotiation, let's say. So immediately I see a person, I embrace a person in a completely different way than I may have done otherwise. Um, and if I can work with a person's reality, and my reality, we can come up with some mutually reciprocal realities. Okay, I need to skip a couple of these. Um, I want to talk about one, uh, education and service development. You know, I won't. I'll talk about the mental health trial community in Ireland. In uh, 2011, Paddy McGowan and myself 
uh, with other colleagues uh, across the, uh, Ireland set up the Trilog Network, which is a series of community open dialogue uh, spaces for people to be able to, uh, I suppose, challenge uh, perceptions on mental health, but also be able to create new truths. So essentially brought together professional service users, family members and interested community members to try and re-understand, redevelop their notions of mental health and begin to address in their lives in their community some of the issues that were affecting them, particularly in mental health services. And you can see the successes, which were fantastic there as well, but nonetheless there were challenges, sustained over uh, many years, it's very difficult to keep that kind of open dialogue going. Sometimes there was less representation of professionals than we wanted, although the professionals that did come always came. And often it's difficult to get family members and carers uh, for a very obvious reason that sometimes they're working, sometimes they're unwell themselves, and sometimes they're caring for um, other people in the families. Not necessarily action orientated, that's not a bad thing, but it is a challenge. It is about the transformatory dialogue itself, um, and it's sometimes difficult to establish trials in the first place in local communities. Um, Jan, I was probably going to come in to me now any minute, 35, okay, I've got four minutes by my guess. Um, recovery colleges, that's a kind of, I suppose, my most recent involvement at the moment. Um, couple of challenges here, so let's look at the successes. So Recovery College, we have shown, uh, can bring about personal and social recovery outcomes beyond and above what some mental health services can do, uh, where mental health services have even measured that. Um, it brings about community connection, it's a pathway for further education and employment, and it's an emancipatory educational process, uh, which is often seen as a parallel way of people engaging in recovery. Not only people with experience, but also professionals, uh, to some extent radicalizing their previous kind of training, and also with family members as well. So really, really successful way of having recovery education in the community. However, most are governed by mental health service, which means it carries the same risk factors. It means that uh, the governance structures that govern mental health services are often governed in recovery college as well. So a lot of what people perceive as non-recovery oriented approaches to mental health services are really just mimicked in the recovery colleges as well. It's, it's, themselves, which, which reduces the capacity for those recovery colleges to be emancipatory uh, and also increases the risk of co-optation. Um, and to some extent within, within the recovery colleges as well, it's the kind of things they're teaching are pretty much the same kind of clinical psychoeducation things that would have been taught in the mental health institutions in the first place, rather than perhaps um, a kind of emancipatory education programs developed within the college by the students themselves. Often they're too successful. Sometimes when you're too successful um, in terms of the, 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 the collaborative model that's brought about by, by the recovery college model, um, it kind of pisses people off um, and um, you, can be, you can be marginalized even as a recovery college. Uh, maintaining true co-production with limited resourcing is quite difficult. And sometimes rather than pretend you're doing co-production, you have to call it and say, right, at the moment, it's not actually working. I'm gonna skip that, um, skip that. Um, at a global level, I'd just like to touch on INTAR. So INTAR has been going since, uh, whoa, since 1989. Um, and it's really kind of an international collaborative, which is looking to overturn the psychiatric paradigm. And it's made up of service users, all sorts of different types of professionals, academics, family members across the globe. It came from the Northern Hemisphere initially, and since 2016 has been more of a global, global network. But the, the key here is, uh, in terms of an example, is that we're looking for that global paradigm shift. And to some extent, for the overall paradigm shift, you have to go from the small to the large first and use kind of, I suppose, some of the drivers like the United Nations Special Rapporteur's Report, uh, engage with kind of other global organizations. So, for example, we've got organizations across the globe that represent service users and survivors, but they're global and European, etc. And the kind of collaboration you can do there can begin to kind of, uh, I suppose, broaden the perspective of how the paradigm shift can move from psychiatry to, to more effective um, mental health care. Um, there are challenges, of course, as we can see there. Oh, sorry about the abbreviation. GMH is a global mental health movement um, attempting to develop and work with social psychiatry. So from people in the global south are concerned, as, as we throw out our ineffective psychiatry, it's just moved down to the developing world and they're just bringing in there instead. Uh, as we in the Western world bring in much more effective practices. Okay. Um, 
Okay, so for us uh, as practitioners, dialogical practice has given us a way, at least as individuals um, and as kind of teams of mental health practitioners, and I don't mean specifically open dialogue, which we've talked about quite a lot, but the dialogical practice that would enshrine principles of open dialogue, for example, where we are in practice, subject to subject, you know, but not just our one-to-one -one dyads, you know, with whole systems, family systems, etc. Uh, even the way we work as as kind of uh, multidisciplinary colleagues, subject to subject, in kind of dialogical spaces, um, it brings multi perspectives rather than just a kind of psychiatric perspective. The curiosity associated with that, with that collaborative journey, allows um, for any potential beneficial outcome to come out, and new possibilities can emerge within this kind of. Uh, uh, practice paradigm and we are in this space moving from psychiatry and non-collaboration to a different space some of the challenges as i think already mentioned is the expertise power and the privilege are known infrastructures have to change because most of our infrastructures are still psychiatrically centered infrastructures um uh, you know born out of coercion and uh, drug drug strategies which aren't necessarily conducive to dialogical practice. So our practice cultures will have to change. And what we considered evidence-based practice before will have to change as we see a much wider, broader, and uh, qualitative effect of evidence-based practice emerging within this kind of paradigm. And the problem is as well, it contradicts the fabric of how services presently run, how relationships presently go, and how treatment is applied. It doesn't mean we can't do it, doesn't mean we don't do it, we've talked about this before, but it's very, very challenging. What's the message I have for you here today? Uh, you don't have to collaborate to provide mental health interventions, not necessary. Um, but if you do, um, know that they're more effective. Don't pretend, because you don't have to do it. It's actually worse than not collaborating, because it has this kind of pretense and this kind of glossy image and kind of tick box exercise. If you go for elaborate collaboration, do it for real. Um, it's worth it. But if you want to enable full collaboration in mental health practice, the new practice paradigm has to flourish and outshine the old. And that's the greatest challenge of all. Thank you. I'm sorry for being a bit over. Thank you so much, Liam, for your interesting and present presentation, because I was thinking that we have in the audience people who are working with this this way and I, I can imagine that they got a lot of this and I get the feeling that you do your work with passion through the fields in this even if you are somewhere in Ireland I got this atmosphere I think you like your work yeah yeah yes thank you thank you Liam there has been a discussion in the uh, chat actually people were talking about tokenism uh, before you uh, Speak, spoke yeah. also, right? Right. and th this seems to be a really important issue we have to solve in 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 real collaboration. There's a one uh, questions from Oti from Finland, and she says, "Thank you, Liam, for inspiring keynote." And the question is, what do you see as most important benefits of this collaboration for professionals, especially professional identity? Okay, um, so I, that's a great question. And in order to answer it, um, kind of uh, going to be mercenary about it, um, because in order to answer it, the collaborative effect for professionals has such a profound possibility for being able to develop as a professional that you almost feel guilty that you're collaborating with, for example, expertise by experience. And through that collaboration, as a professional, you're developing way beyond you could possibly develop in how you understand humankind and how you understand the ability for people to thrive and flourish that your training as a professional could never, ever do. It's only in the process of that collaboration that you learn more about yourself as a professional and more about your ability as a professional to be helpful. So for me, it's quite embarrassing to say that collaborative working um, did more for my ability to become a good practitioner than any of my training ever did over 20 years. I'm not sure you think that answers that question. Very good. Liam, there's a lots of uh, hand claps in the, in the chat, so people are thanking you and we are thanking okay. you. This was wonderful speech and good start for the second day of our conference. Uh, thank you, Liam, and you. I believe that you will be in the audience uh, during the days. 
day. Yes, of course. Yeah. So if you have, want to talk to Liam or make some other comments or questions, you can find Liam from from here. So now we move on. We have a, a half an hour break now, have a coffee and refreshments, and then we start our sessions. And this is also a very good time to go out a bit and take some nice picture of what is uh, representing men good mental health today for you and then publish it with hashtag ECMH2020. Please do that. Very good. See you. See you. See you. Good luck. Bye. Bye-bye.